on Business Incorporated. Zimbabwe exceeds Africa Health Funding Target. Egypt liquidates state-owned enterprises and turns to private sector to fuel economic recovery. And the new South African Airways resumes flying this Thursday after being grounded for 18 months. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. First, we begin with the market numbers. And starting off here on the African continent, the JSA index in South Africa traded positive over half a percent. Also, the main index in Nigeria was up, but just marginally. Elsewhere in the region, the EGX30 in Egypt climbed 0.30 percent, while Kea ended Wednesday session positive up 82 basis points. It was a different picture in the Middle East where investor sentiments were mixed at intraday. In the UAE, the Abu Dhabi index was up 0.55%, while Dubai index lost 0.15%. On the flip side, the Qatari index surged 0.56%, while Saudi Arabia's market dropped 0.40%. And in Europe, stocks opened higher in the morning as global markets reacted to the latest sentiments, statements from the U.S. Federal Reserve in which it said it was not ready to taper monetary stimulus yet. For more, here is Christie. Hello, Christie. Good afternoon. Well, European stocks rallied for the third day in a row today. Where is the optimism coming from? Yeah, hi, Jimmy. Well, of course, it has a bit to do with uh, what you just mentioned, the Federal Reserve, but I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, a lot of the optimism in the last couple of days uh, has to do with developments we've seen uh, regarding the Chinese real estate giant Evergrande. Um, of course, anyone following the story knows that uh, we, uh, a week ago we were talking about a Lehman Brothers st potential collapse. Uh, Lehman Brothers style collapse, I should say, uh, for this company, uh, which is heavily indebted um, and, and un unable to, to pay back a lot of its creditors. Uh, now, a few days later, uh, we're, we, we, it seems like the worst case scenario is going to be avoided. It seems that China may be able to manage uh, this this company's debt and um, the European stocks, uh, particularly the stock 600, had a steep uh, drop on Monday. But the next, the past three days, as you said. We've been seeing healthy gains as it's uh, looking more and more uh, positive for for that scenario. Uh, we're also seeing, uh, yeah, news out of the U.S. where you know, there's uh, signals that uh, they could start tapering their their pandemic stimulus as early as next month. Uh, so I think uh, we are sort of transitioning into uh, the next phase of our pandemic-ridden uh, economy, and uh, there is a bit of shakiness. Uh, but today, at least in Europe, uh, things are are looking up. Mm. And at the same time, economic growth in the Eurozone slowed in September, according to a closely watched survey from IHS markets out today. So what does this mean for the trajectory of uh, Europe's uh, pandemic recovery? Yes, that's true. That's a great point as well. I mean, uh, d despite the, the sort of optimistic, uh, more global approach we're seeing, you know, mentioning China, mentioning the U.S., we are still dealing with some issues on the ground here in Europe uh, related to largely the pandemic. Uh, so according to uh, this corporate confidence survey we saw, um, we saw the results of today. Uh, results last month were, uh, were showed slower growth than the month before. This uh, economist attributed this uh, slowdown to the, the same culprits we've been seeing for a few months now, supply chain bottlenecks caused by the pandemic, higher consumer prices, and outbreaks of the Delta variant around Europe as well, which are uh, dragging down business. So uh, now at the same time, they cautioned that the figures are still in the healthy range at this point. However, that could change in the uh, colder months ahead, uh, particularly if uh, consumer inflation and the supply chain bottlenecks aren't somehow brought back under control. So uh, well, it's definitely uh, one to watch um, and, and not a given that will be a smooth recovery in Europe just yet. Mm. And in another development, there are signs of reconciliation between France and the U.S. after a $66 billion French submarine deal 
uh, was killed when the U.S., Britain, and Australia announced a surprise agreement of their own. Now, President Joe Biden and Emmanuel Macron spoke on the phone yesterday. Why the change of heart from France? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it seems what's happening is France is to some degree coming to terms with the, the nature of the political landscape that we are living in today. Um, and uh, by that, I mean, of course, France is, is a, a, a global power and has been for centuries. But today, uh, the real true powers are really the largest countries uh, around the globe. And of course, there we're talking primarily about China and the U.S. So countries like France, which, uh, you know, certainly uh, are used to bringing a lot to the table, are, are, are struggling a bit to to, to find their place in that dynamic. So when this uh, massive submarine deal fell through for France, that was a big hit for them, not only financially, but also militarily. Uh, this is a country that has uh, has strived to maintain a pretty solid military presence around the globe. Uh, and I think that there was a bit of a, a feeling on the part of France of, of being uh, sort of kept out of, of a deal by by countries that it sees as its peers. Of course, it, uh, France reacted very strongly, uh, for example, pulling ambassadors uh, out of those countries and I think this was a bit of a shock to the US the UK and Australia but yes in the end Joe Biden did uh, give a call to Macron and uh, it seems that they're working towards a concession now and I think that this was a gamble that that these three countries took when they made this secret deal um, that France ultimately would have to capitulate uh, to uh, to cooperating in the end all right. Thank you, Christy. Just one more day to say thank God it's Friday. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs> you too. In the UK, the Bank of England has left the interest rates unchanged and also lowered its growth forecast for the UK economy. Let's bring in Juliana for details. Hello, Juliana. Well, good afternoon. Uh, ahead of the BOE uh, meeting, economies, uh, the bank will be more worried about uh, the impact on the economy for the gut prices, uh, prices rather than on inflation. Now, having heard from Andrew Bailey and his team, what are the key takeaways there? Uh, good afternoon, Jim. So as you were just saying at the top there, the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee have um, unanimously decided to keep interest rates at the historic low of 0.1%. Um, but there were two members of the nine strong team that voted against maintaining the quantitative easing program, which I believe is at about £875 billion. In the takeaway minutes, obviously lots of the discussion was quite squarely focused on inflation, really. Um, this time last month, when they released the minutes, inflation um, for July was standing at 2%. But, um, you know, fast forward four weeks, inflation rose by 1.2%, currently standing at 3.2%. Uh, the Bank of England and now have increased um, what they believe inflation um, will reach by the end of the year, which is over 4%. That's quite a massive jump uh, for the UK. And it's these, this surge in prices, which they believe is halting um, the UK's economic recovery. As you said, they've revised down uh, what they believe Q3 uh, growth should be. We're going to be getting those numbers over the next um, couple of weeks. So it's, it was a little bit um, downbeat. There were uh, s some signs of hope. Um, at the moment, we are seeing that uh, the labour market is quite robust. But of course, Shimaze, in the next couple of weeks, um, in fact, next week, uh, the furlough scheme uh, which has uh, saved millions upon millions of jobs is going to be coming to an end. Business rates relief, um, other uh, tax uh, saving schemes that the government have put in place, they will fold. Um, what is going to happen to the million or so people that are still on furlough? Yes, we are seeing that there are a record number of vacancies available, but if you don't have the training capacity, you cannot fill uh, those jobs. Also discussion about labour shortages um, too. But of course, the headline is, after all that waffle, interest rates remain the same at 0.1%. And as we are seeing with lots of central bank governors at the moment, um, they're saying we're just going to have to sit this out and wait and see. And if the follow scheme is coming to an end, a UK government minister says consumers should not panic buy following warnings that Britain faces mountain problems uh, this winter. Uh, what is going on now? Why should a consumer not panic? 
Well, there is um, there there are a few issues going on, Jimmy. The first one, of course, is the major one, which is um, the rising gas prices. How does this affect food? Well, CO2 um, is a component uh, used to try and keep beef. Um, a, a, good enough to go onto our shelves. And uh, last week, um, a, a supplier from America that provides a significant amount of CO2 in this country, they cease trading because of uh, the supply uh, prices. Yes, the British government are going to be giving uh, them a loan of tens of millions of pounds to keep them uh, trading over the, the next few weeks. What is going to happen beyond that? We're still waiting to hear uh, from the business secretary. Secondly, um, an issue that we've been speaking about a lot is the new Brexit migration issues. This has become a major issue. There are so many restaurants. First of all, it's McDonald's, Nando's, KFC. It's now creeping into the supermarket shelves who are struggling uh, to get their produce uh, because the drivers are just not able to deliver them. There's a shortage of about 100,000 uh, drivers. So uh, yesterday afternoon, the National Farmers Union chairman wrote to the prime minister, who's in New York still at the moment, asking him to do whatever he can to kind of loosen some of those uh, migration uh, rules to allow people from the Europe to come in and fill these jobs. A lot of these jobs, unfortunately, British people just don't want to do them. Um, there was um, a survey conducted last season uh, that showed in the run-up to Christmas 2020, only 11% of those who were working in farms and picking food were from um, Britain. The vast majority of them uh, were from the continent and beyond, but those workers are not given the opportunity to come in and work at the moment. So it's a massive issue. There are lots of issues going on um, at the moment, which I'm sure once the Prime Minister's back at his dispatch box will be put to him at Prime Minister's questions. Now, in all of these um, developments, how are the markets behaving this intraday? Well, yes, the market was actually in tip-top um, shape um, at um, early trading, but the Bank of England has pushed it in the red, and that's because of the strong pound. So even though the FTSE All Share was in positive territory, it is in negative territory at the moment. But in the currencies market, uh, the British pound is up on the US dollar, also up on the euro and up on the Japanese yen, Shimaze. All right, thank you very much, uh, Juliana. Hope to talk to you again tomorrow. And shares in Asia-Pacific were mostly higher in Thursday's trade as investors in Asia-Pacific continue monitoring the situation surrounding China Evergrande Group. Hong Kong's Hansen Index rose 1.04% of its final hour of trading. Following losses earlier in the week, it had returned to trade after a holiday on Wednesday. Shares of China Evergrande Group in the city jumped more than 17%, preparing some gains after soaring more than 20% earlier. Mainland Chinese stocks closed higher with the Shanghai Composite climbing 0.38%, while the Shenzhen component advanced 0.77%. South Korea's Kospi, returning to trade from holidays earlier in the week, slipped 0.41%. The S&P ASS 200 in Australia edged to 1%. MSCSI's broadest index of Asia-Pacific shares outside Japan rose 0.74%. Meanwhile, markets in Japan are closed on Thursday. And U.S. stock index futures were higher during early morning trading after the Federal Reserve kept benchmark interest rates unchanged while indicating no immediate intention of removing stimulus policies. Futures contracts tied to the Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 105 points. S&P 500 futures and Nasdaq 100 futures both traded in positive territory. Some of these weeks' weakness is thanks to concerns over heavily indebted Chinese property developer Evergrande. The company did announce on Wednesday that its real estate group would make interest payments on time, which assuaged some fears. The Department of Labor will release initial jobless claims numbers today, while several companies are on deck for quarterly updates, including Durden Restaurants, which reports before the market opens, while Nike and Costco Wholesale will provide quarterly updates once the market closes. Flash estimates for September manufacturing PMI and services PMI will also be released. When we come back after the break, commodities market update as well as some um, other developments on the African continent will be next.
Nigeria was once ranked amongst the leading palm oil producing nations in the world and was a key exporter of the commodity, but it is now ranked fifth, producing less than 2% of global palm oil supply. Recently, palm oil prices have been rising globally. What does this mean for Nigeria? Adeye Adebusi, research analyst with Financial Derivatives Company, will take us through this. Hello, Adeye. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. So Nigeria, once a leading producer of palm oil, is now fifth. What is the reason for this and what lessons can Nigeria learn from the current top producers of this commodity like Indonesia and Malaysia? In the 50s and 60s, Nigeria produced about 43% of global palm oil production. However, in 2020, Nigeria produced only 1.28 million tons of palm oil which constituted only about 2% of world palm oil production. The decline in palm oil production can be attributed to the, to the export, exploitation of crude oil in the 1960s. This decline, there has also been a decline in other agricultural cash crops like rubber and cotton. However, um, but, um, in 1966, Malaysia and Indonesia surpassed Nigeria in terms of palm oil production. Both of them combined now produce about 80% of the world's palm oil production. Palm oil, Indonesia and Malaysia have successfully invested in research, development, and the use of machinery to boost production. They have also used a palm oil council or corporation that has been able to aid finance research as well and promote cooperation between producers in the industry. Or, um, um, there is also the, the, the percentage that they levy from the export duties. They also replowed and are reallocated back into the back into the sector to aid finance for both small and large scale producers. Now, Adeye, recently we are seeing palm oil prices rising. I mean, since the end of 2020, and so far it has uh, increased by 19.63% in the first nine months of 2021. What is responsible for this upward trend? Palm oil prices have risen to all time highs in 2021. Palm oil price went as high as $1,100 per ton in May. The rise in palm oil prices can be linked to decline in production from the top exporters, Malaysia and Indonesia. Labor shortages and labor shortages and poor weather have affected their crop condition this year. Um, the average yield of the average yield of crop of crop in Malaysia has reduced drastically from about 1.56 tons per hectare in 2020 to 1.41 tons per hectare in 2021. Also, palm oil processing mills in, across Malaysia and Indonesia have been affected by coronavirus-related restrictions, which have seen shortfalls in production. Um, we expect palm oil prices to continue to rise throughout the year due to rising coronavirus cases in Malaysia, which will affect production. And there will be a shortfall labor in these current plantings planting season. In terms of the Nigerian industry, Nigerian palm, oil, Nigerian palm oil producers have experienced increase in revenues over the past few years due to um, the global rising prices and the ever-present demand for palm oil in Nigeria. And companies like Fresco and Okumu have increased their production and processing capabilities over the past few years. In the first quarter of 2021, Okomo's revenue increased by nearly about 50% to 12.9 billion naira, while press schools revenue increased by 47.5% to 7.6 billion naira in the first quarter of the year. Now, in spite of its numerous import substitution policies and strategies, Nigeria is still uh, a net importer of palm oil and losing its global ranking as a leading producer 
what can be done to make these um, strategies, you know, more effective? In 2020, Nigeria consumed 1.74 million metric tons of palm oil, while it only produced 1.26 million metric tons, which creates a deficit of about nearly half a million metric tons of palm oil. And in order to make up for this deficit, we have to import from abroad to satisfy our local demand. Palm oil has been added to a list of commodities that have been banned, that have been banned access to forex for importation. This saw palm oil production increase by 13% to 1.28 in 2020 from 1.1 million metric tons in 2018. However, there is still a need for the government to provide a feasible plan to reduce our import content and realize our export potential. The, especially in the agricultural sector, the government can provide financial subsidies, imputes, and machineries to help boost production amongst the local and rural farmers in the country. She said that if Nigeria maintained our market strength in palm oil years ago, we would have been earning around $20 billion annually from palm oil production and processing. All right. Thank you very much for your time a day. We do appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Zimbabwe has surpassed the declaration target, which requires that countries spend at least 15% of their national budgets on the health sector. This is according to the Finance and Economic Development Minister, Professor Mituli Nkube. He said this while addressing delegates at the International Business Conference that was held yesterday at the ongoing Zimbabwe International Trade Fair. Under the Abuja Declaration, African countries are encouraged to commit at least 15% of their national budgets on health to foster the sector in line with the Sustainable Development Goals. And following the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, Zimbabwe has been on the forefront on the continent in fighting the disease. Government has indicated that part of the resources will be channeled towards supporting the health, manufacturing, agriculture, education and mining sectors. And the new South African Airways has resumed flying this Thursday after being grounded for 18 months since March 2020. The first flight took off this morning from the Otambo Airport to Cape Town. The airline says their return will mean more competitive pricing and will enable more South Africans to fly. Local flights take off with at least three trips per day between Johannesburg and Cape Town with regional flights set to resume on the 27th of September. SAA's fleet size has been drastically reduced from 46 to 6, with some leases ended while the airline was undergoing business rescue. Currently, only 88 pilots are employed, down from the previous 600. And Egypt is turning to the private sector to fuel economic, putting an end to loss-making state-owned enterprises recovery. The Public Enterprises Minister Hesham Tawifik in a meeting with the IMF says the message now to the economy and to the masses is that they are partnering with the private sector wherever possible. The discussion centered around the IMF's latest report on how countries in the Middle East, North Africa and Central Asia can reform state-owned enterprises. And Ethiopia has asked the International Monetary Fund for a new deal days after France and China co-chaired the first meeting of the nation's major creditors panel to restructure the nation's previous debt. Setting up a creditors panel and an agreement on how to deal with Ethiopia's nearly $30 billion of external debts paves the way for the IMF to determine how to engage with the country on economic recovery. The lender's executive board has yet to approve disbursements from the extended credit facility and extended fund facility, the former of which has expired despite reaching staff level agreement. And provisional figures from the Ghana Statistical Service puts Ghana's current population 
are 30.8 million. This forms part of the outcome of the 2021 population and housing census, which started in June. This represents a 6.1 million increase from the 24.7 million recorded during the last count in 2010. The gender demography also revealed that 50.7% of the national figure are females, while males make up 49.3%. And that's it on the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Chimizi Obi Iwagu.